<laughs> so everyone, welcome to the 178th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Uh, this is the latest in our regular and monthly meetings. Um, we're calling this 178, but we're reserving 174 for the SEF talk. We, we haven't forgotten about it, but we're still hoping to get around to it. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing from George Neville Neal with a talk titled, FreeBSD and Linux and Comparative Analysis. Tonight, before we get started, we have our usual four quick requests. First is make sure your cell phone is silent and quiet enough that you can not bother anybody. Second is do not use the coffee maker. Coffee makers, espresso, anything that's got a sign on the main one, so just please don't do that. Do not eat any snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation or snacks that make noise uh, or anything like that. And please use the mic for questions. Um, George is going to accept questions during this presentation. We're going to try to get around to you and give you the mic so that uh, we can hear you. And so the questions can get on the record and so anyone watching can hang up and see it. Uh, we'd like to thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space. This will be our last regular meeting in this location. It's been a great couple of years and we really appreciate everything that Google has done for us. I'd also like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brand Or Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. In addition, Dialog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who contributed greatly over the years and continue to do so. After the meeting, um, we encourage everyone to join us for talk and drinks at McKenna's Pub at 250 West 14th Street. We we'll have a couple of groups heading over, so don't worry about taking down uh, the address. Our reservation is for okay, 8.30 or 8? 8? 8.30. 8.30, that's right, I wrote that wrong. So, announcements. Uh, aside from this being our last meeting at this office, um, we won't be having our regular talk next month, and we'll be taking a month off from our presentations to prepare for our new firm meeting space at Bloomberg's offices in Midtown. Please note that when we meet at Bloomberg, your real names and IDs will be needed to enter to attend. Uh, in lieu of our talk next month, though, we're going to plan to have a social event, uh, a get together on the 19th to celebrate the last day of winter. Details are still to be worked out. That stuff will appear on Meetup and go out through, uh, go out through the usual channels. It's going to be informal, so if you go, bring your own beer money. We don't have a sponsor, but if someone wants to sponsor, just let us know. We're happy to let you know. Um, our next scheduled talk will be at Bloomberg, and uh, that will be on April 16th, and we'll be hearing from MySQL Age, uh, MySQL Ace, Sherry Capital, on the latest updates on the MySQL and the um, on the workshop front, I think we're still in limbo with our workshops, uh, so it, basically our usual space has been getting uh, uh, an overhaul from the New York Public Library. We haven't nailed down another space. If you have any ideas, let us know. Though I think that the repair should be coming from this, right? Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, we, we may have missed a few, but that'll be, uh, it'll resolve itself soon. Um, so if you have any leads, though, please talk to Rob. James or David and let them know and you know if you do find another great space we'd be happy to use it. That would be good for you, let us know. Um, in case you missed it on the way in, by the way, there's a table in the back with Linux distro DVDs. Uh, grab one if you like this month uh, for this presentation. We've also got free DSD and K3DSD DVDs. So the goal is for everyone to grab a new distro for yourself and try it out. Um, I'd also like to announce uh, a lot of announcements, this is more than usual. Um, Drupal, Camp, uh, Drupal NYC Camp 2014 is coming up. It's a four-day event with sprints, talks, and classes on Drupal. This year, the event will be held at the United Nations from April 10th to the 13th. And if you are interested, uh, please see Rob and us if you'd like more information. You can find them at www.nyccamp.org or on Twitter at NYCCampDrupal, all one word. Uh, does anyone have any additional announcements? Anyone? Uh, come on. Yes. Hi there. Uh, I'm Robert Wiener. I represent Unigroup, uh, New York City Unix Users Group. We normally meet the third Thursdays. We've been around since 1980, long running group. For everyone who in the, office, in the room here who says they never use Unix, FreeBSD is based on Unix, and so are your uh, iPads and iPhones. Um, we're not meeting tomorrow. We're taking a snow day, uh, letting the snow melt. We will meet the third Thursday next month. Uh, we're working on a Hadoop talk, so we're trying to confirm that right now with, um, actually I'm not going to announce it since it's not recorded yet, until the meeting is confirmed. If you're interested in the Unix Users Group, please see me after the meeting, I will be here, and I can add you to our mailing list. We are a paid professional membership, we have food, good food at every meeting, and uh, we 
meet typically over at the Cooper Union School of Engineering. That's in the East Village, 7th and 3rd Avenues. 7th Street, East Avenues. Thank you. Does anyone else have? Oh, Brian, more? In case anybody oh. doesn't know, uh, tomorrow, uh, although the RSVPs are full, Richard Stallman will be talking at Cooper Union. They said, um, if you want to risk it, go ahead and show up. They'll be letting in the general public um, if there's room. So, all right. That's it. So again, RMS is going to be at Cooper Union tomorrow, you said? Tomorrow, yes. Right. Uh, any other announcements? Just a follow-up to that. <coughs> The New York, I'm not actually affiliated, but I know the New York Tech Meetup has a simulcast of the Richard Stallman broadcast. It's on meetup.com, and that's, I think, still great. Any others? Um, you know, we're going to try something a little new. We used to have a jobs list that's been down for a long time, but we do typically have people who come in and we either want people or we want work. Uh, I'm just going to go with this convention. If anyone who is hired, just raise your hand. Anyone looking for people, raise your hands. Okay, if anyone is looking, raise your hands. Okay, all of you guys should meet in the back, or let's say in that corner after the meeting, just for a few minutes to figure out if you are a match. Um, talk to each other, see what you want. Uh, and what will happen is, uh, if you want to post your jobs to the Nylog mailing list, just come and talk to Brian, myself, Rob, or anyone else, just make sure it's you know a fit, and use the mailing list to send it out, and we'll try to you know, keep it to a same level so it doesn't I'm not saying any of you are, but just in case you know, too much to too much. Anyway, um, with that, I think that's the last of our announcements. Oh, no. All right, please hold your, uh, please uh, ask your questions as you go along. George is uh, welcoming of that. So, George Neville Neal comparing FreeBSD and Linux 7. Okay, my traditional first question can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. And the tape is happy. So, uh, I've been asked to talk about FreeBSD and Linux, the comparative analysis. Uh, so, uh, let's basically get to it. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about this evening. So, I'm going to give a, a brief history of BSD for those of you who don't know much about it. And then, we're going to talk about both technical and non-technical comparison because, um, you know, FreeBSD and Linux are both a technical and a non-technical product. Uh, so I'll talk about both of those things throughout the evening. Um, I have another question for all of you, which is how many of you can program in C? Wow, I'm seriously in trouble. That's great. Because <laughs> um, I'm going to show some data structures at the end of uh, the talk, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to wind up doing a huge amount of explanation about what, why they matter and how they matter and, and how to compare them. Um, I'll, I'll admit that that's not a huge part of the talk, but I do think that how code looks and how code represents itself and how APIs are done um, is one way to not only compare the operating systems, but actually to compare the philosophies, the development philosophies of the two groups. So I'm going to talk about that a bit. And the fact that you all program in C is both amusing and useful. Um, some existential background on me. Who am I? Well, I do network protocols and TCP IP, and I do a lot of security stuff. I've spent uh, 20 or more years um, working on various BSDs and on operating systems in general, including embedded in real time. Uh, some of my software runs on Mars. Uh, some of my software is stealing all your mail. Depends on which bit of software we're talking about. Um, I'm the co-author of a book about FreeBSD, Design and Implementation of the FreeBSD Operating System. I am currently working on the revision, which will be out as soon as Pearson can publish it, um, and as soon as we finish. And I'm not allowed to say a date. But we will be doing a, we're doing a new version of the book. I've also been heavily involved in FreeBSD. So, I mean, this slide basically tells you that I have a dog in the fight. Um, I've been a member of FreeBSD's electric core team. More about that later. I'm currently a director of the FreeBSD Foundation, along with many other people, uh, which works to promote the project. Um, also, I write a column called Code Vicious. I spent the last 10 years talking about how not to develop software. Uh, nice. So, in the beginning, and we're not going to go through this in detail because I would put you all to sleep and Rob would just correct me. Um, so, we all know about Multics. Multics did nothing well, but it tried to do everything. And so, in response to the Multics, uh, Carnegie and Ritchie built up Unix at Bell Labs. Um, 
Why is that important? Well, it turns out there were some people at Berkeley who really liked Unix, but they didn't like everything about it. So you know, how did the BSDs come about? The BSDs did not start out as an operating system. The Berkeley software distribution started out as a set of tools you ran on top of AT&T's Unix. If you had $1,000 and um, a license from AT&T, a very possibly expensive license, i.e. if you were a large university <coughs> like the University of California or you were SUNY or something like that, you could not only get Unix to run on your computers, but you could get a bunch of tools. You could get VI. You could get the Pascal compiler, which, how many of you program in Pascal? <laughs> I will admit the freshman year was Pascal where I went to school. Um, but the point was that the, the BSD stuff was not an operating system by any stretch of the imagination. It started out as a set of tools to wrap around the uh, If you had a license, you could get a tape. How many of you have tapes at home? <laughs> um, Are they usable? Uh, I have not tried to read mine. I, you know, as usable as confetti. Um, so, You've got these, this group of researchers, they're working on Unix, they're working on AT&T's Unix. Um, but, you know, there's a bunch of work going on at the time. They're building this crazy thing called the ARPANET and the internet, and they need programming APIs for it. And uh, there's a bunch of folks at Berkeley who start extending the operating system. What they're doing is, you know, open source didn't exist at the time. There was no license. There was no GPL. There was no uh, BSD license. There were no licenses. There was your license from AT&T, and as long as AT&T didn't sue you, you could send tapes to all the universities. That was what open source was. You just handed out free software. And if you got lucky, people attributed your work in a paper. Um, but CSRG, the computer science, computer systems research group, at Berkeley, which was the group of people who developed the original Berkeley software distribution, Bill Joy, Kirk McCusick, Keith Bostick, Mike Carrolls, Sam Leffler, a bunch of people whose names you really ought to know. Um, they were working with the DARPA, which is the Defense Department. And DARPA was spending millions of dollars um, funding research on networking and packet switching and many other things. And they were tired of a million different Unixes. So they wanted one. Unix to rule them all and in the network find them. A lot of what Berkeley did was to make it so that TCP IP would actually work. Um, a lot of their initial work was making TCP IP work. The sockets interface that we all use, sockets API, developed by Sam Leffler, who actually works at Google, um, many years ago, and it's the API we've all used. Linux uses it, FreeBSD uses it, all the BSDs use it. There are socket APIs for pretty much every single operating system that exists. So that was the next bit of work. So an amusing little side story. Um, there was one guy who worked for CSRG, Keith Boston. Keith is a very bright man, and he's very intense. Uh, he went off with Morgan Seltzer, and they built Sleepy Cat DB, which was eventually bought by Oracle. But while Keith was at Berkeley, it really bothered him that they didn't have a complete, what um, Linux people call a distribution. Uh, and in FreeBSD, we just call the operating system. So it wasn't complete. You had to take you know, bits and pieces and glue them together and all this stuff. And part of the reason for that was that the entire system was not um, written in an open source manner. A lot of it was written by people who were paid by at and by different people. So you had all this code mixed together. And Keith really wanted to have a whole distribution. He wanted to take a tape, because we still had tapes 20 some odd years ago, um, or a stack of floppies, a very large stack of floppies, um, and give it to someone and have them able to bring up an entire system without having to take bits and pieces and glue it together. And so Keith went to the rest of the computer uh, systems research group and he said, okay, I'm going to get a group of volunteers and they're going to replace all of the AT&T code in every single file and we're going to ship an operating system. And um, Kirk, who was ostensibly their leader, uh, thought to himself, that's never going to work, but I'm not going to be able to stop you. So instead, I'm going to let you kill yourself by trying. Um, Keith is a pretty convincing guy. Uh, he actually got me to add extensions to VI. The original VI had a bunch of scripting language hooks for it before NVI. He got me to do this. Um, he can be very convincing. And he did it. So they rewrote all the non open source code. They created a self hosting operating system. They removed, well, most of the last bits of the AT&T code. Uh, and something that was called, well, from the 
Berkeley side, they called it BSD light. So that was what they called 4.4 BSD. And then there was a project to put this on a new cheap architecture that Intel was making at the time called 386. So you could get 386 BSD. And this was Bill Jolitz and Bill and Lynn Jolitz built this distribution of BSD that would run on 386 boxes. And you could get it and it was uh, free-ish. Um, and you could install it and you could run it and you had a real Unix workstation on a really slow piece of hardware, which actually at the time was a really fast piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the hardware specs at the time, you'd be amazed that you actually got virtual memory and all the other things to work at all. But it, it was, it became a self-hosting operating system and that's, that brings us basically to the early 90s. So, some folks took the code, um, created a company, BSD Inc. Uh, they produced a commercial BSD system, $1,000 of uh, license, you could buy it, came with source code, uh, you could build your ISP around it, which is actually what a lot of the first ISPs were built around was the BSDI stuff. Um, and uh, their phone number was 1-800-ITS-UNIX. <laughs> and you know, lawyers, lawyers don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> um, computer people, we sort of have a sense of humor, but lawyers really, really don't have a sense of humor. And to be honest, this is the thing that got AT&T to look at what was a PSDI, was they were like, what do you mean it's Unix? What does Unix mean? What is the Unix trademark? And suddenly, very large people with a lot of money and a lot of lawyers start suing each other. Um, this is extremely bad, it turns out, for an open source project. Being sued will freeze your project in its tracks. Mm -hmm. And it effectively froze BSD for about a year. Um, the judgment eventually was in favor of BSDI and the University of California because AT&T didn't just go after BSDI because BSDI was small, small potatoes, right? I mean, BSDI didn't have a ton of money. Turns out the University of California has a tremendous amount of money. Um, it's taxpayer money, but it's still a lot of money. Uh, so AT&T sues the University of California and BSDI and they all go to court and in a stroke of luck, um, the plaintiffs, the defendants in the case, university, get the case moved to a uh, court in California. So a New Jersey company is suing a University of California in the state of California. <laughs> Turns out where your case is tried is really important. Uh, remember that if you're ever sued by someone very large, make sure it's tried in a place where you are considered friendly. Uh, because that's one of the reasons they want. So, delayed for a year. Um, that gets us to the end of the lawsuit. So what happens then? So 386 BSD had actually um, atrophied quite a bit, and the Jolitzes had stopped working. So you wind up with um, two different groups of people at about the same time going back. The Computer and Systems Research Group issues what's considered the last version of 4.4 BSD. That system is not complete. There are about six important files missing. I don't remember off the top of my head which files they were. Um, there are six important files that have to be re-implemented by whoever receives it so that you can actually have a bootable, runnable operating system that will do something. Um, so from there, start two of the major BSDs, that's NetBSD and FreeBSD. And I'll talk about the different flavors a bit um, in another slide. Some number of years later, we get OpenBSD. I suspect most people have heard of OpenBSD uh, because they <coughs> talk about it. Um, and then for a long time, that's, that's really what you get. Uh, the BSD, FreeBSD is now more than 20 years old. We just had our 20th anniversary party last year. Um, NetBSD similarly, OpenBSD is coming up on 20 years. PSD is the, the PCBSD is the newest, we'll talk about that. There's also Dragonfly, but that's kind of a really small BSD that I don't talk about as much. Um, so, you know, over 20 years, it's one of the things that's very interesting when you talk about a comparative analysis. One of the things people talk about in terms of the BSDs versus Linux is that in BSD land, it's very easy to fork because of the way the license works. And in Linux land, it's hard to fork because of the way the license works. But it turns out that we actually don't fork that often because operating systems are large and complex, right? And a fork in the Linux world really is a distro, right? Okay. You have a 2.6.3 kernel, you have a 3.1 kernel, you have whatever it is under there. But you've got Ubuntu and Red Hat and Fedora and CentOS and all these things. Those are sort of the equivalents of the way we, we wind up doing things in the BSD land. Um, so while people talk about us working a lot, we 
we don't support that often. And the thing I find funny about this, that particular comment about any system now, is almost every single Git hosted source repository is like, oh, fork my code. <laughs> okay, if working is bad, except when you're on GitHub, then it's good. <laughs> so these are the current major flavors of, of the BSDs. And when I say major, they're used in a lot of places. So NetBSD runs a whole bunch of things like printers and routers and a lot of embedded stuff because NetBSD's done a lot of uh, really good work to be cross platform. FreeBSD, if you use a Juniper router, NetApp uh, file storage. Uh, any, uh, who has a PS4? No one has a PS4? Wow. What's a PS4? <laughs> anyway, I don't have a PS4, but if you're running my code if you've got one. <laughs> um, Sony actually copped to the fact that they're running FreeBSD in their games, game console. Turns out that Xbox is not running FreeBSD. <laughs> as far as I know, I mean, if I get a support mail. Aren't are all the networking I.O. drivers from the FreeBSD distribution? They, they might be. I, I don't know. There is an Xbox port here. They did, that explains a lot, though. <laughs> I haven't used an Xbox either. There is right. an Xbox port of a free music. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I need to do in my free time. Uh, so why do we have these forks, and what are they about? And then let me talk a little bit about that. Um, and very broadly, so the NetBSD folks, they did this amazing job of making the BSD code run on every single processor that's ever existed. I think NetBSD still runs on a VAX. If you still have a VAX, um, but it'll run on everything. It runs on ARM, it runs on MIPS, it runs on SH, which is a, a Hitachi chip. It runs everywhere. They did this amazing job of doing, of making that work. We've done some really, really great stuff there. OpenBSD, well, we all know what OpenBSD does. Um, they, they do security because they're so paranoid they make me seem normal. Um, <laughs> but the OpenBSD people do a really good job. I mean, they really know their code, but as, in terms of, Feature addition and moving forwards with things, it's taking them a very long time to get to something like SMP. It turns out SMP is a huge problem for security. So, you know, they lag there, but they're, they're the ones who did OpenSSH and any of the things named open with something after it. Um, they're, they're very big on the open world. Uh, they also make great t-shirts. Uh, so, FreeBSD's original thing was to be rock solid on Intel hardware. The idea was that we would make it, we would sacrifice everything else, all of the portability, to make it so that we work as well as possible on standard off the shelf servers. Um, and that was the, the phrase at the time was rock solid performance. And it was, you know, this is in the, you know, now we're at FreeBSD 10, this is in the FreeBSD 2 days, which is you know, 17 years ago, 18 years ago. Uh, but that was commodity hardware, right? The idea was that we could run on commodity hardware and it would just work. You'd install it, it would work. Um, some number of years later, so for those of you who ever have installed FreeBSD, it is not for the faint of heart, right? Um, we have had more complaints about the installer than anything else besides maybe the old package system. Um, you know, you take a Ubuntu desk or, you know, Ubuntu, Ubuntu actually made their, made their livelihood of doing this. It's like, stick that in and the thing will just install. It will do the work and it'll, it'll just install. FreeBSD, um, until recent installers, you had to understand disk geometry, which, you know, maybe your mom didn't understand disk geometry, or whoever else was installing it. Um, so PCBSD, which uh, was done in the early 2000s, <clears throat> the idea was to create a distro, something that looked like a Linux distro, around FreeBSD, so you could give someone a DVD, and they could install it, and it would actually just work out of the box. Um, and that required a bit of work. Um, there's a huge amount of scripting and getting things right and making it look good and you know making sure you can detect all kinds of crazy devices that people might have plugged in. So PCBSD is kind of this desktop version of FreeBSD. It is a desktop version. Of FreeBSD. Also works great on laptops. As a, a laptop fan, I carry basically a Mac and I carry an X2 whatever the most recent X2 is. So X220, X230 because those the Intel boxes usually run. Uh, the Intel boxes. The Lenovo boxes, former ThinkPad boxes, run the BSDs particularly well. So let's compare philosophies. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of philosophy, but let's compare some philosophy. Um, now, this is not an official legal statement. I am not a lawyer, nor have I ever been a lawyer. I have never practiced law. But um, if you read the BSD license, here's what our real goals are. 
in terms of the license, don't sue us. I think we got kind of burned by the whole suing thing, and we wanted to make sure that don't sue us was in there. So no warranty, you run the code, you accidentally blow up a building, it's your problem. <laughs> um, but we really want people to use our code. So this is one of the things where um, the BSD license and the GPL, and if you look at the evolution of GPL v2 to v3, and I've actually been through all of them, I've been through GPL v1, v2, and v3, um, where they're somewhat different. So in the BSD world, take our code, do what you want, don't sue us, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, well, you can call us, that would be nice, but you don't have to. So the only, often the only way we find out, the BSD folks find out, that someone's running our code is they send a mail to the mailing list, that's how we found Sony. Um, you know, we, we find out from someone who's been secretly hired to work on a project, oh, by the way, do you know this runs in this thing? Um, what usually happens, and particularly this happens in FreeBSD, because FreeBSD is particularly good for appliances. Um, and where I, by appliances, I mean like storage appliances. Almost every storage appliance, like significant, big, not like that little Soho router you have a disc on, but like a NetApp, an Isilon, uh, and so a Compellent, several others, they all run FreeBSD. Um, and so what will happen is, you know, a group of people will be like, oh, great, FreeBSD, we don't have to give the code back, we don't have to give our secret sauce back. And BSD folks were fine with that. You want your secret sauce, you want to make money, go ahead, just don't sue us. Um, they'll go, they'll build a product, and then they'll realize, oh, an operating system is really complicated. And uh, there's a lot of things we could change and we could fix and we could, you know, improve. If only we could talk to people. And so they'll usually do version one, maybe version two of their product. And then they'll show up at a developer summit or a vendor summit or on a mailing list and say, yeah, we, uh, we took version four of your system three years ago and we built a product around it. We made a lot of money. And now you're at version six and we'd like some help getting from four to six. Which actually, by the way, for those of you who don't know FreeBSD, version five is when we did symmetric multiprocessing, which is pretty much the worst thing you could ever possibly do to your operating system because you get to go through the entire thing and lock every single data structure and then watch it crash when you forgot one of them. So version five is one of those ones that's, that's, that's crossing the Rubicon. It's like microprocessor, multiprocessor, big chasm. Um, so that's how we usually find out about people because we have no requirement to get back. Now, this has some deleterious side effects, right? This means that there are huge swaths of new, new and interesting code that many people have developed often that we're never going to see and we can't force them to give them back to us. But we've decided that we, the various projects, that that is our philosophy. Our philosophy is we're not going to take anything from you that, that you don't want to give us. You want to give it to us? Great. We've had some amazing features added by people who have built on our software. But there's no legal requirement to do so. And that is actually a really big difference. Um, another part of the philosophy, and this is a development <coughs> philosophy as opposed to a license philosophy, the goal, in particular for FreeBSD and generally for the other BSDs, is we produce a whole system. So when you install FreeBSD, you get mm, minus X windows, um, all of the tools you need to build software. You get compilers, you get debuggers, you get TCP dump, you get all this stuff, you get NFS. There's a whole bunch of things that just sort of show up. Now, in Linux, the distros will do that. But if you take Linux, what Linux actually is, like kernel 3.3, or I forget what the kernel 3.4. I've got Linux next on my thing. On my there you go, 3.3. Um, you take that, you don't get all of those things. You wind up having to use Package Manager to get the rest of the tools to build the system. And that's actually a, a pretty significant difference. And I actually don't know where that comes from. I was thinking about that a little bit on the way over, why, we, why it's so important for us to produce a whole system. Um, and I could ask a few people in the community, but one of my theories is, um, any of you remember when Sun took the compilers out of Solaris? Oh. Right. I am pretty sure, for those of you who are younger than me, um, so back in the days when Sun was a company that produced hardware and operating systems, as opposed to being a fully owned division of Oracle, um, they also produced the whole system. Was right. SunOS up through Solaris something. You had SunOS against Solaris. You got everything. You got the compilers just like you would expect. And then they were like, ah, oh, compiler suite, yank. Right? And suddenly you couldn't do things like build your other open source packages without getting the compiler suite. So in the BSDs, you always get it. 
Um, you get everything you need to build more software to build up more of a system out of what you've got. So that's how I, I term R for us. So, okay, I just went through this. Let's talk a little bit about what you get. Operating system, obviously. Um, one of the funniest things I find about working on operating systems, every OS developer wants to rewrite the scheduler or the memory allocator, right? But that's what we believe is important because that's, that's the hard part. Two things to tell you, that's not the hard part. And while it's very important, it is only necessary but not completely going to cover everything else. But you, you get the operating system, which is all the APIs, APIs, and all that stuff. Um, drivers, compilers, and associated tools, debugging tools, and editors. You still get VI installed. You have to install Emacs on your own. Um, <laughs> <laughs> full disclosure, I use both editors. I use both VI and Emacs, depending on my mood. How much of a mess is that? Um, but once you install, you're ready to code, right? So that was, that was the world that the BSDs came from, was you wanted to install this so you could actually do some work. And the work at the time was to build more software. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about some of the technical features, some of the things that, that for the most part, don't exist in the Linuxes. Um, I figure people at a New York Linux user group meeting knows, know what technical features are in Linux. So I have to explain it. Um, we do not have a plethora of file systems. And in part, that's because the file system written by Kirk McCusick originally, the fast file system for the original Berkeley software, has really stood the test of time up until the point we got to basically ZFS. So up until the point where you had massive RAID systems and zettabytes of data, that's UFS, um, UFS was able to basically grow. We, you know, the original fast file system didn't have a log. So you know, you'd get if someone created a log-based file system, Kirk went back in and was like, okay, well, we'll just you know, create a transaction log that'll handle all the things that LFS does and we don't have to have another file system. Every time someone added something like journaling updates or some feature, Kirk would look at it and go, I can re-implement that in UFS. So we still have UFS and it's the test of time. It's changed a lot. Code base is not the same. But that's sort of the main, uh, what I would call, normal storage file system. That's what you're gonna put on your, your install base. ZFS uh, developed by our friends at Sun, an amazing piece of software and a really interesting technology. Uh, you know, logical volume management, all of the modern features you expect when you're talking to a massive RAID storage system. Uh, and you know, their license was sufficient <coughs> to where we could actually take their code in. Um, that's actually been another big problem if we want to talk about <coughs> licenses and problems. We also cannot take in GPL code. So we will not ship GPL code because that would pollute our downstream vendors. And their lawyers don't want GPL code. For reasons that are well, totally obvious. Um, another great feature, and actually it's one of my absolute favorite features, it makes teaching operating systems to people much easier, uh, and that also comes from, from uh, Sun, is Dtrace. So Dtrace is basically the systems programmers and systems administrators gift to debugging. You want to Look at a live system, you want to pull it apart, it's basically the scariest root kit you will ever enable. Because um, that's what it is, it can read your memory, it can look at all of your function battery uh, tracing, you can see every argument, I can see your password if it's gone through the, you know, root kit, uh, which is why you have to be root kit. VNet uh, is something we developed a number of years ago. Uh, virtual networks, so within the system, this is not virtualization like VMware virtualization, this is simply a virtualization of the network stack. Network stack is a, had a huge number of global state, <coughs> tremendous amount of global state. And we went through and we pulled it all apart and we made it so you can actually have instances of network stacks. And you might ask, why would you want that other than for you know creating crazy debugging scenarios? Very useful. Um, it's very useful in large uh, network deployments. It allows you to run simultaneous parallel uh, overlay networks on top of each other. And it turns out that there's a lot of ISPs that run FreeBSD, and they were very happy to have this technology. Jails, um, you know, lightweight virtualization is the right way to call that. And, uh, oh, we have a Linux emulator. So this is how we run Linux code. Um, we can actually run Linux uh, binaries on FreeBSD by installing a port that has all the proper <coughs> system call mappings for, you know, we usually track Fedora core.
So let's talk about governance is another uh, difference. Um, we have a democratically elected core team. So what does that mean? Well, in Linux, who's the ultimate authority in Linux? Right. We, we have no king. Um, so the core team is responsible for maintaining the governance of the project. And for the last 20, uh, probably 18 years, has been elected every two years, and it is an election <coughs> by the people of the people. Uh, if you have what we call a commit bit, which I'll go into a little bit later, then you are eligible to um, vote. And that's how I became a member of the core team twice. Now, no one wants to run for core. Because all core ever does is settle disputes <laughs> and you know find out about legal problems that has to go to the foundation and you know, make policies and do all the things that developers don't want to do. Um, but everyone on the team knows that it's something that's necessary, right? These these things to have a vibrant, alive, large project. We're talking about you know a million lines, over a million lines of code, run by many many people in the world. You're going to have to have some group of people who can stand up and pretend to be responsible. Um, that's my job. Pretend to be responsible and. You know, govern the project. We have very, you know, we don't often, actually we never have fights, which is nice. There are no fights. There are risings of tension that then <laughs> go down and then come up and then go down. And, you know, if you look for, you want to look for something funny, look for a thread on FreeBSD about offensive fortunes. Like, who wants to get involved with whether or not we have offensive fortunes? But that's something the core has to do because two developers decide to, you know, start removing all the right-wing fortunes and start removing all the left-wing fortunes, and eventually you have like one joke left. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and Core does a lot of things, but that's a lot of, that's, you know, what they do is keep the product moving forward. Um, so, the way in which you get to contribute to FreeBSD, and we usually call this punishing you with a commit bit, and I'll talk about that process in a moment, but those of us who have commit bits are able to commit into the Subversion repository, we currently use Subversion, we use CVS before, and before that we used SCCS, that was the BSD days. So we have, you can actually look at every single commit back for 20 years on FreeBSD. You can go through all the branches, you can, you can make yourself fall asleep like that. Um, that's having a commit bit. And then we also talk about hats. So when someone has a particular responsibility, and I'll talk about these in a moment, we, we say that you have a hat. So. People will send mail and they'll be like, I'm doing this with my core hat on, which is usually like YouTube, you know, stand in opposite corners, I'm doing this with my core hat. Um, but we have, no, we have no dictator, we have no central authority, there is no one person. In particular, no one on core now has served on core since it began. Right? It's rotated over and over. Um, we're actually now talking about term limits, which I'm quite in favor of. I term limited myself after two terms, I'm like, that's done. I'll go back, but I want to break. I'd like to go write some code. So, um, how do you, can, you know, every open source project has a different philosophy around how people uh, come to acquire the ability to commit code uh, to the system and to, you know, developers, yes. Can I ask a question about your time when you were not on the board? Oh, God. Um, not another thing that people love that, just in general, you're saying, well, if you'd like to go back to writing code, it seems like your, your job is to be technical. What were you, did you have a work-life separation there, or like, was there a sponsor for you to be on that? Um, well, probably should admit on tape that I have really poor work-life separation, since you've seen the number of FreeBSD things that you've kind of like very embedded. Um, I also was writing code. The, the thing is that being on core can be a distraction, but it's also incredibly useful. Um, the reason people usually join Core, and the reason I joined Core, is because they want to wave a flag about a particular topic, right? So the nice thing about Core is Core can't really tell the project what to develop. We don't have, we have talked about, but we do not do have uh, what I would call like a technical advisory board. There's no committee that's like, we're going to do blah. Um, you know, we did SMP because we had to do it, right? We did all these other features because either we had to do it or they showed up. But one of the things that you, can, that you can do on core that can be particularly effective is it raises your visibility in the community to the point where you can say, oh, this is really important. And at the time that I ran for core, we were not doing a very good job, in my opinion, on embedded processors. And my 
background in, in operating systems is also an embedded, I have to like embedded. And I also know that, I knew that for the project to continue to do well, we had to address the embedded market. Right? So people on core often have, let's call them nascent marketing skills. Uh, don't want to say that I have marketing skills, but I have nascent marketing skills, and many people on core do. And so that's why we wind up there. But it's definitely, you know, it doesn't stop you from coding, but you have to pay attention to that stuff to make sure that the project doesn't go off the rails. Does that answer your question? Okay. So how do people become committers on, on FreeBSD? So you join mailing lists. We have a ton of mailing lists. We now have forums. There are other places. But let's just say that the median age on the project is only about 10 years younger than me, and I'm in my late 40s. So we're a mailing list culture, right? And we have forums, and we have other things, but they almost always point back to the mailing lists. And maybe we'll be that way forever, because we seem to poison the minds of young people who join us. We get them to use mailing lists. Um, down with code, obviously. Send patches. So, um, you know, this is kind of the main interaction that people who are not committers have with committers, because they'll look at a driver or some part of the network code, or, you know, I'm, I'm working with a couple of folks at a very large <coughs> networking company whose name I will not put on tape, um, where there's three folks that are working on FreeBSD who are like, look, you've got these bugs, we really like them fixed. And I'm like, I really like your fixes. And then, you, know, <laughs> you go around that a couple of times, and eventually you're like, I'm really tired of reviewing your code. You're so competent. Stop sending me mail. Um, so they send you patches to the point where, and this should be the next one, uh, they wind up being mentored. So someone who has a commit bit can mentor someone who doesn't have a commit bit. So I have mentored several people to be part of the project. And what a mentor does is you know, they review the patches, they make sure they fit our style guidelines, we have a whole set of style guidelines for coding styles. Coding style. Um, you know, we point them to things they have to test. We make sure they don't break the tree very often. Break the tree a lot. We don't like to give you a commit bit. Um, you know, we're, we're there to help, really. <clears throat> and so you get a mentor. Eventually, that mentor is so tired of reading your patches <laughs> that they send a mail to Core. Core app. We're like, can you please give, you know, Billy or Bobby or whoever it is. Just give this person a commit bit. I, I promise to attest for the fact that they will not destroy the tree. And I'll, I'll help them, but please, please make them not send me all of their patches. Um, <clears throat> but usually by that point, this person has been on the mailing list, they've been sending patches, people know who they are, right? It's this sort of a gradual process of getting to know them, right? They don't usually just drop out of the sky. Occasionally that happens, but it's a little confusing. Um, so almost everyone who gets proposed gets a commit bit because they've already been around for weeks or months, sometimes a year. Um, and, and still the mentor has to review all our patches. So everything that goes in the tree you'll see reviewed, you know, reviewed by. So you'll see reviewed by GNN. Finally, they're free from mentorship. You know, they've been committing things, they haven't broken the tree. Um, we have one guy on the project who I won't use his name. Um, he's a really brilliant engineer, but he is super picky. And no one on the project has not gotten the mail from him. Right? You'll make a commit, and you get this very long mail, and it's like, you did this wrong, and this wrong, and this wrong, and this wrong, and this wrong. You're right, you're right. You're, no, you're wrong there, you're right. <laughs> Eventually, you stop getting those mails, too. But you, so you free the person from mentorship, and then off they go. And they can destroy the tree. Um, <clears throat> and then it's their job to find a mentee. So this is how the project grows. This is how we get people in, this is how we train them, and this is how we get them to get more people in. It is not a fast process. Um, I've mentored, I don't know, I, I have to look at the tree. I've mentored pre probably a couple of people a year for the last few years. Um, you know, interacting with someone else's patches takes time. And those people who send patches are usually busy. Um, I've had one guy I've been working with at a particularly large vendor that uses FreeBSD who's really great and who I really want to commit more, but he shows up every six months. And he's like, I've got a patch. Great, it's an awesome patch. Hello. Hello. So, you know, it takes time. It's not like we can just go hoover up engineers and throw them at the operating system. I don't think we'd want to do that. So that's twice a year, then how many simultaneously? Um, so the question was, if, if I've mentored two people a year, how many simultaneously? You can take on as many as you wish. Um, 
I try not to take on more than two because I generally have a huge amount of my own work. And usually, for me personally, I really want to. Some people will just read the patch and be like, yeah, that looks okay, yeah, but it's true. I will actually take people's patches, compile them in my own tree, build them, put them in, et cetera, et cetera. That takes time. So I personally don't do two. There are people who do more, um, there are people who do fewer. So hats, I mentioned hats. Um, this is the way responsibility is handed out on the previous email. So there's core hats, which I mentioned already. We have a security officer as well as a security team. I've served on the security team. I have thankfully never been a security officer because that seems extremely painful. Um, Tom Bristol, who was our security officer for quite a long time, did an amazing job. I don't know how he was able to do that. And now we actually split the job amongst two people for the security officer job. It's a sec team as well. We have release engineering hats. Don't you have one of those? Not yet. We'll punish you later. <laughs> um, the release engineering team has both people who are the release engineer. I'm going to cut a release. And then we have people who work on release engineering and who are working for that. Uh, ports. I haven't mentioned ports at all. So for those of you who work with whatever package system is on Linux. So for the longest time, what FreeBSD had was called the port system, which was a, which is, remains, a huge tree of 20 five plus thousand other open source packages that can be built for free use. It's in this massive you know, tree structure. And the way we mostly got people to do packages, I mean, we had the ability to make packages, but it was not anywhere near as advanced as things that you would get on Linux instruments. Um, because, and part of that's because of, uh, let's not call it hubris. We were working to our own type. So most of the people doing ports, building ports and packages on FreeBSD were other developers. and we couldn't understand why anyone wouldn't know how to type make. <laughs> how do you not, like, you want this thing, you go to type make and you get it. Um, well, we had a package system, but it was, it was perfect. Now, we actually, just this year, have an amazing new package system, which is really quite, quite good. Um, <clears throat> but there's a whole team that maintains it. The ports team is actually huge, because you're talking about maintaining 25, 30,000 different things, everything from, like, Emacs to Apache to, Every language that anyone has ever thought of, you know, Go, C, Java, Ruby on Rails, whatever, it's, they're all a port. And so no one really has more than a couple ports. I mean, some people are truly masochists and they have a large number, but those people are they're impressive and I don't want to be one of them. Um, so the port team is huge. Uh, and there's a port manager. There's a port manager. And then there's a huge documentation team. So uh, FreeBSD documentation is translated into a lot of languages, many, many, many languages. And so the doc team is another thing where people have hats. And the doc <coughs> team and the source committers and everyone all interact in the source code. So for instance, our documentation team is allowed to change any comment or any bit of documentation anywhere in the tree. Right? They, you know, they may not be C programmers, but they know how to not break the code. And they know how to correct programmer spelling, grammar, and ask them questions like, did you really mean to say that if you do X, you get Y? Because often programmers don't say the right thing. So documentation is another set of hats. All right, let's talk about source code control. We are big fans of it. Um, this is the way the FreeBSD is about. So, and I actually should have brought a laser. I'll just point. Um, so, this is the main line, and in this main line, you have release branches. So this is the 8 release, this is the 9 release, this is the 10 release. This is where all work gets done. If you are really doing work on FreeBSD, you're doing it in the head of the tree, and then if you decide that that bug fix, that feature, or whatever, can be merged, and I'll talk about what can and cannot be merged, then it gets merged from current, we call merge from MFC, merge from current. So we'll, you know, I just recently merged some stuff into 10, which is our current, uh, which is our, at the moment, currently released brand. <coughs> um, we generally will maintain uh, branches for you know, some number of releases, usually about two years. Um, but it depends on what we're doing. What we mean by maintain is that we'll still apply security fixes. So, you know, we, used to, we usually see, and actually, 
you can totally see this if I showed you my mailbox, my inbox, which I won't show you. Um, what you'll see is as things progress, you know, when this was, when 8 was the sort of main thing being released, there were a huge number of merges to 8. So, you know, we release 8.0, there are bugs, there are fixes, we're merging bugs, we're merging bugs, we're merging fixes. We didn't bug that. Um, you know, we're merging a tremendous number of fixes into 8, and then, and then we release another release, 8.1, we release 8.2, and then 8.3. And people can also, you can merge new features, but there's a very important bug. We will never, ever, break a kernel programming interface within a number branch. So, if your code ran on 8.0, and it was not something that violated the security of the system, fix that. Um, it will run on 8 forever. You can run on 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 8.7. 8.7. If you had a device driver that worked in 8.0, it will always work. We will never, ever break a kernel programming interface within one of our right. Now, and we also, well, we'll never break a KPI. Um, so that's kind of the only limit on merging. So you've got a new feature. If you, know, you want this really cool feature, you've got a new device driver. But that new device driver requires a change to the current. You're going to have to figure out some way to twist yourself in a pretzel if you want to merge it because we are not going to surprise, or astonish, as we call it, our users. Um, there's something we call the principle of least astonishment. And that is one of the, a very strict rule in FreeBSD is we will not surprise our users. So we're very big on that. Um, and this is one of the things that actually uh, kind of sets FreeBSD apart from other, from, uh, from the Linux systems. Modern Linux is a lot better. Uh, certainly to switch to using better source code control help. But, you know, the number of people who are like, I went from kernel 2.x.y or 3.x.y to 3. whatever plus 1, and my thing stopped working, that is something that we just won't do. We will just not tolerate that. Now, that does have some deleterious side effects for us. It means we have to move slower, right? That means that we can't, we can't really advance in here, right? But we can advance as long as we don't break the API. Which means you have to be really careful about our ideas. So I talked about branching and merging. Oh, yes. How often do people want to bring new features into stable branches? Like okay, so the question is how often do people want to bring features into stable branches? Well, all the time, because developers are really impatient. Right? You know, someone's like, oh, I just spent three months doing Fiddly Boop, and Fiddly Boop is awesome, and I'm going to put it in the kernel, and I'm going to be famous. So I wrote bad pages, and it's great. Um, and then we're like, yeah, Fiddly Boop, you know, Fiddly Boop breaks that. It breaks TCP IP. You just, you just broke the network stack. You can't do that. Um, and uh, something I'll talk about when we look at a little bit of code is we try to be really careful about data structures as well. So someone will be like, oh, I. I want to add this new feature that's only available on 10 gig cards that are doing some fancy kind of processing. It's like, great, that's fine. Oh, but I need to change this structure. Well, if that structure doesn't have spare space in it, then you can't change it in the current release. Right? So we're really careful about structure space, too, because the structures also get changed. Right? They, and the structures can change so long as it's additive and so long as the size doesn't change. The size of the structure changes, as I know you all know C, we're good on this one. Uh, that's going to break you. Again. But I mean, I would say, I, w I wouldn't say it happens every day, but it definitely happens several times a year that we're like, yeah, not unless you can create some, usually we wind up creating shims. Um, but that doesn't usually make people happy. So let's talk before I go into a little bit of actual comparing stuff inside the kernel, um, inside the operating system, talk about what, some of the things we have in common, right? We actually have a lot of a lot of things in common because we come from the same sort of background, right? Um, you know, if you compare us or Linux or anything to something like Windows or you know Plan Nine, and Plan Nine came from Unix, but it went you know, a lot of it. Um, really different. Or if you look at traditional embedded systems, where you've got you know where they don't have virtual memory, right? you're just programming in the raw. Um, so we've got a lot of things in common. POSIX, I actually was going to put in POSIX-ish, 
because both Linux and BSDs try really hard not to violate POSIX. I don't know that Linux tries as hard as we do. Um, but you know, we bend POSIX. We both bend POSIX in different directions. Virtual memory, right? I mean, everybody just sort of takes this for granted now. But, you know, that was a really big deal. And that's something that has not changed, right? That, this is the thing, right? This is what we all program in. And we can do your program. System calls, how you access the kernel. I mean, the implementation of system calls is different, but that you've got a system call table, and this is how you get in, and this is how you get out, and this is how you, you know, okay, you copy in data differently than we copy in data. Our ioctals are different than your ioctals in terms of how we, you know, where we do the copy in and what we do about it. But, you know, it's the same kind of programming to the, to the user, to the user level programmer. Um, we try to present, I think, a relatively similar fix. Um, and we all have the X-Windowing system, the albatross of user interfaces. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was a brilliant idea a long time ago. Um, but, you know, it works. It's whatever. It is what it is. Um, I don't want to re-implement it. <laughs> that way. I, I hate to rewrite it or even think about it. So I wanted to talk about a couple of um, data structures, try and look at some of the things I talked about comparing how the two groups develop software. Now, this is highly, highly biased. Okay. Not only is it highly biased because, you know, I'm a FreeBSD person. It's also highly biased because I basically pick the code that I look at every day, and I'm a network nerd. So there are, you know, I actually, before the talk, I talked to a bunch of people about, um, you know, I talked to the BSD people about, I'm giving this talk, I really want to be balanced, and I want to, you know, find some of the stuff in Linux that they do really well. And a lot of it is stuff that I'm just not familiar with. I mean, the CPU set stuff is really nice. It's better. Definitely how you guys deal with, uh, how Linux deals with um, setting processes, pinning processes to CPUs and cores is more mature in Linux than it is in Linux. And that's one of the things I started looking at, but I couldn't really make a good comparison. Uh, and the other one, which actually I'm going to go back and look at because I'm really interested in it, is namespaces. The namespaces stuff in Linux looks really nice. So I'll have to re-implement it because you have GPL code. But um, so I'm going to just go through a couple of kernel structures. I'm actually going to bring up Emacs. So don't be afraid. Um, uh, it's not meant to be definitive, but I, I want to try and talk about a couple of things that I find to be different between the two. Um, so at the very heart of the networking system is how it deals with memory. Uh, and in Linux, you have the CBUF, and in uh, BSDs and FreeBSD, we have the MBUF. Um, SkiBuffs are all in one, which means if you look at SkiBuff, and I'll, I'll show some of that in a moment, you'll see that every networking feature has some feel in a SkiBuff, right? Everything. So SkiBuffs know all about all kinds of crazy stuff in networking stuff, and features and VLANs and all this stuff. Um, MBuffs, we went for a different uh, model. So MBuffs are extensible, blindly extensible using something called MBuff tags. So we're very big fans of not putting specific tag bits <coughs> into data structures because then they get confused or mislabeled or overloaded. Um, what we want to do is give you a, a way to extend a core data structure. So you, know, you look at a ski buff, what's in it? Everything. I like to say everything more. Network features are directly embedded. It violates network layering. Um, who knows who Van Jacobson was? Is he's not dead yet? Okay, good. So the guy who made it so the TCP/IP doesn't collapse, Van Jacobson, really, really, really important guy. Um, Van has this great quote, which is when you look at the ISO seven layers and you look at the way networks done, and you're like, oh, well, you know, I've got data link, I've got this, I've got that. Van's comment is that um, layering is a great way to think about networking. It's a really poor way to implement it. These attempts to make things work. Uh, but SkiBus violate network layering all over the place. SkiBus know about Python, and I've, I've thought about doing a little bit more code splitting to find out why that is. But I'm like, why do you? That's just no. So it's a little confusing to me. Um, 
What's in an end buff? Well, it's kind of the, you're going to get a lot of opposite lists, right? There's very little in an end buff. Um, it's a union with flags for personalities. There are different types of end buffs. Um, we can mark an end buff as having embedded data. It's one of the things that, uh, one of the interesting comparisons. Um, so, how many of you ever looked at a ski buff? A few of you. Okay, so let me give a little more explanation. So, ski buffs have something that works out very well on a large memory machine, which is they have the embedded memory for the packet, which means that when someone goes to look up the data for the packet, they don't have to do any indirection. Right? So, that means it's very fast and it has less cache. And buffs come from a time when the VAX had a lot less memory. Uh, sorry, less memory than my phone. <laughs> so, uh, my watch. So, uh, MBUFs are, are far more flexible. You can have external memory, you can point to all this stuff, but managing all that takes time. And so, ski buffs are actually more performant in certain cases because you have very direct access to the underlying bytes. That's a really good thing. Um, so, with an MBUF, you've got this union of flags for personalities. Am I a packet header? Am I pure data? Do I have external storage? Because I might have internal storage, which is very fast, or I might have external storage. may not have data, may not have external storage. But <clears throat> only the packet header structures have layer violating knowledge, right? And they have far less of it than you would find in a schema. There's a little bit of stuff in the MBUF packet header where it's like, oh yeah, I know about this, but there's no socket, right? There's a socket pointer in a schema. Um, so, that, um, one more thing. So, one of the things we try to do is, so that we don't have to change uh, data structures, is if we can change the size of the data structure, then we can't put that new feature back in the release. We want to have this data, data structure size is not changed, so we can maintain binary compatibility. Now, how do we do this, right? I mean, how do we make it so that we can extend stuff? So, one of the ways is extension by abstraction. <coughs> We created this thing called MBUF tags. So, MBUFs have some embedded data. They can have, I'll show you some of the things you can have in a packet header, but they can have generic tags. You can call the tag whatever you want. You can make up a 32 bit number. Um, usually, it's made up of the date that you actually created that type of MBUF tag because most people don't collide and create the same feature on the same day. Um, and these give you things like per packet attributes. This allows you to do firewall. Right? So instead of having any of the firewall intelligence in a ski buff, you're like, oh, let's have a firewall. Oh, let's change the structure. It's like, no, let's have a firewall. We'll have a tag. Right? And then the tag comes in. We're like, oh, check the firewall tag on. Check it through the firewall. The firewall's oh, I'm done. Takes the tag off. Right? And that's one of the design philosophies for BSDs, or for BSD, is that you can, you can do this extension without changing the way the data structure looks. Uh, another example of this that I did because I'm working on this at the moment, um, I can create a timestamp uh, uh, stack. So if you look at very modern network interface hardware, it has a whole bunch of time stuff on it. For doing time protocols, I work on time <clears throat> And for DSD, all I need to do to get that piece of data from the device driver up into user space is to create a tag, put it on there and have it pulled off. I don't have to change the size of an end buff, and I don't have to add a field, I just have to. So, good size. Um, this allows extension without recompilation, structure size doesn't change, binary compatibility, can code. Um, but there are some advantages to doing things with us. So this is one of the things we've looked at frequently on 3DSD in terms of packet forward. So if you're doing uh, intrusion detection system, you want to look at every packet and you want to look at that. Well, if you have to do a lot of indirection, that's going to cost you time. And it's going to not only cost you time for the indirection, but you're going to thrash your cache. So the nice thing about a ski buff is once you've pulled it up into memory and once it's sitting in a cache line, you're not going to destroy the cache. Right? So you get direct access, all in one. So it's one of the, one of the comparisons. Um, bad side, well, often in computer science we say that you know everything can be solved by another layer of abstraction, but eventually you get so many layers of abstraction you're running Drupal. <laughs> 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 um, and so that's important, right? You trash your cache, you lose performance because you're doing lots of direction. Um, 
for something like a ski buff, which is 2K, <clears throat> or I don't remember actually how 9K packets are done for jumbo frames, but in, in regular frames, 1500 byte, even a packet, it all fits in the ski. Well, that works in such one very important case. There's a case of very small packets in, uh, in networking, and that's called packs. And every single pack you send back is not going to be that big. So, if you spent all of your memory by building a, let's say you've got a huge web server that's just, you know, sending acts out all the time, those acts are only, I don't know, 100 bytes, 200 bytes, not very many bytes. So you've wasted, you know, an extra, you know, 50 <coughs> bytes just to store and then transmit that act. Okay, granted, you can have a half terabyte server. I just had one built. Um, but you really not, you really prefer not to do that. Right? So the fixed size, the fixed large size, <coughs> In that case, actually, and changing the structure changes the ABI. So if you change the ski buff between two versions, then you've broken your ABI. You may have broken your ABI. So right, this is backwards. That's fine. Let's go. So the next data structure I want to talk about, I'm actually going to show this data structure. Um, how many people have ever looked at a net device? Down to none. Uh, someone. Okay. Um, this is the other thing I happen to look at because I, I wind up working on network device drivers. Let me put that up there. Um, and so I look at the way, you know, I know how we do and I'm like, okay, well, how does this work? Um, the network device structure has even more state than this cube. It has a massive amount of state. And I'm going to go through that. And it's all collected together. And if you want to talk about layer violation, it includes everything about the interface and about the device, like the hardware. It includes all the hardware and every and the, every other piece of state. Um, this results in a very large hard to understand structure. <clears throat> it does have some nice centralization. Here, let's uh, let's go visit Emacs. Oh, right, I love this. I, I have to admit this made my life so much easier. And I'm a bad person in all the language terms. But I didn't write this. <laughs> I went looking for the net device. I, I actually should have done a, uh, a, a blame to see maybe what is wrote this. I don't know who's wrote this. Uh, and this is IO data with strictly high level data. It has, has to know about almost every data structure in the INET module. Fix me. Please fix me. So, Let's look at what, they're, what that comment is talking about. Um, so, right. So here's a bunch of pointers to where our, yeah. I can just read the fix me's out. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't do, that seems sort of dull. Uh, knows about the low level device memory, right? So if you're on an Intel NIC or a Chelsea NIC or a whoever's NIC or a Broadcom NIC, you actually know that in this structure. Um, you're on many lists, right? You're on the device list, the network API list, the registry list. Um, I'm going to go at some point and find out. This one's brilliant. I love this. Um, there's both an edge list and an all edge list. Uh, so this includes neighbors and that. Um, you have your features, hardware features, wanted features, VLAN features, MPLS features. There's another good one in here. Ah, oh, here we go. I like this one. This is my example of why this structure needs to be made. Um, we have flags, all of BSD. I don't actually know what that means. Um, those might be the original IF flags from fconfig. I think that's what it is, like up, down, promiscuous, multicast. Uh, that we know what. Private flags, G flags. Um, unfortunately, this padded is uh, not padding as you can see. So I looked through, I actually did look through the history for this one. And it's just accretion. It's accretion of things that need to be redone, right? So it's just, you know, they keep extending this device So, you know, it's huge. Uh, let's make this first. Um, 
pointers goes on and on and on. Okay, now we're in there. So, and here's one thing you'll notice. We get to the end of the structure, and as far as I can tell, some of the room can correct me if I'm wrong, there's no padding, right? So any update to this, any increase in its size or any decrease in its size will cause binary compatibility. That's a problem. Now, let's sure go back. So, <laughs> how do we do this? We do. Um, I do not claim that our solution is perfect. Direct. It was highly amusing to me because uh, I will admit, when I went and looked at what someone had recently done to our MBUF structure, I was considering flying to a foreign country and committing a crime. <laughs> uh, I won't say which one, just a crime. Uh, so, you know, we, we also do silly things. But um, in FreeBSD, we try to separate certain bits of knowledge from other bits of knowledge, right? This results in this indirection, and the indirection can be expensive, as I said, but it makes for a much more tractable, readable, understandable, and uh, safer piece of code, because you can actually you know, go through and find out what's going on. So we have several structures. We have the if net structure, and that's sort of the, the non-device state of an interface, right? That's things like the flags. Is the device up? Is it down? Is it multicast, et cetera? It knows very little about the underlying hardware. There's no device pointers. There's no, where is my bus DMA memory? Where is, you know, where are my registers on the PCI bus? I don't know anything about that. It's just sort of an abstraction of an interface, network interface. Um, we used to call this soft C. Now people have started calling it adapter. Some of that has to do actually with people trying to maintain device drivers on Linux and FreeBSD. Uh, Linux has a device, so we device. Um, so, sort of a generic point of the hardware interface, this is going to be the first older device pointer. Um, link layer data and protocol data. So, we've separated these out into different structures, and I'll give you an idea of what this is. So, we'll notice this starts a little, it's a much shorter uh, structure because it doesn't include everything for the device. So, I'm going to bring up, you know, we name our, our Linux the devices are named like E0, E20, E2, E3, and the BSDs and the FreeBSD, they often have um, company specific names. So like. We yeah, have the Intel mix, our IGB, IXGB, IXGBE, uh, Chelsea 10 gig cards, or CXGB, CXGBE. So think of this as this would be like E0. Um, we've got a couple of pointers, things I talked about, driver state, protocol bits, network stack instance, this is for virtualization of the network stack, we never talked about that. We have a list of all of the if nets in the system, so every time you bring up an interface, we create one of these things, we put it on a list. Um, find it with name, driver name, unit. Um, that's how you get like IG, like your E0, E22, ours is IGB0, ours is IGB1, and E2. Uh, we have reference count, which sure doesn't go away before it has to. Um, one set of flags, one set of capabilities, one set of enabled capabilities. So this is, what can I do, what am I doing? Um, uh, this is like data for SNMP, uh, you know, so <coughs> multicast and stuff. So this is actually a good right? Because this, it knows about multicast. Well, not every network interface does multicast, but it's here anyway. Uh, and then we have something similar. I mean, no one doesn't do this, I think. Uh, I do kind of like this. Have our uh, object-oriented programming. So, the device and if debt are both object oriented, which means we have methods and data. And we don't have C. So, we have that and happiness. C <laughs> never leaves that. Never leaves that. So, this, these are all the things you can do with an if right? You can output data, you can input data, you can, uh, 
the start routine was when you could actually key data and then you'd start the transmitter. Uh, you have your IOS routine, initialize, telephone cast, watch your cues, uh, reassign the, you can move the network interface between virtual network instances. And then right at the end, so we've got a bunch of locks. We've got a little bit of pollution, like TSO Max. Why do we know about TSO? Why not? But spare fields so that we can modify sensitive data structures without changing the kernel binary interface. Must be used with care where binary compatibility is required. So every time we do a release, when there is a 10 release or a 9 release, an 8 release, when there's eventually ESD goes to 11, um, like, uh, like that app, then we will add a bunch of these um, so that people will still be able to MFC things back into the release branch without breaking binary compatibility. Now sometimes we make a mistake. Sometimes we don't add enough. And then we're like, uh, you know, you'd like that feature in 10.6, but it's not going to happen because there's no space. Um, we try really hard to do that. And actually sometimes we'll go through and we'll collect space. Like, you know, this doesn't need to be here anymore. This gives us four bytes or eight bytes uh, back. We'd like those eight bytes back or eight bytes. So, and then we'll look at that. So what do we do with all the stuff, all the hardware-specific stuff? Well, that sits in a hardware-specific data structure. Um, this is the adapter structure for a Chelsea OT4T5 card. It's a 10 gig card. Um, it's where all the stuff about it. where's our registers, where are our uh, MSI X interrupts, here's all of our bus space, bus space banks to get memory, um, our resources, our mailbox for messages with the device, um, interrupts, DMA, <coughs> task queues, uh, information on ports. If you've got a card that has multiple ports, that's actually in its device structure. Um, layer two tables. These are, you know, these are things that are specific to this device. No one's ever going to see them if they don't need to. And then we've got our pointer. We can get back to our internet structure. Usually pointer. Uh, we've got a mutex. We have design, uh, device specific capabilities, link capabilities, link capabilities, offload, RDMA, iSCSI, fiber channel. Um, these don't pollute the rest of the system. So. Sure, let's say I bring up a card that looks just like this card. And I've, anyone here ever written a device driver? Anyone ever written one from scratch? Really? Okay, there's two people in the whole world who've ever written a device driver from scratch. Every yeah. device driver <coughs> is a copy. Right? You, you're like, oh, this kind of looks like the uh, old copy. Intel, blah, blah, blah. Who's going to copy the directory and compile it and remove things? And add things until it works. That's how people write the <laughs> That's what I meant from scratch. I meant like if you started with, you know, header, write it in my structure. But nobody does that. So, so, but the next thing is that all of this stuff that really isn't going to be important to anyone else um, is never going to pollute the system. Now, you know, if you look at, there was a previous card to this, and I'm sure the developer, who I know, is a really good developer, I'm sure he started from previous version and give it up. But none of this winds up polluting the rest of the system. No other interface will ever see this. It's not what we want. Nice if net structure, two-force structure. Okay. So if net and associated structures versus net. So Ethernet's more compact, and in particular, if you don't have a complex lower level device, like a, a 10 gig NIC is a really complex lower level device, and it's got a lot of stuff in it. Capabilities and this, that, task queues, memory, you can pin things around, and you can um, But if you don't have that, then you don't have that, right? You're not going to have to look at it. So mentally tractable, um, gains only necessary data, and then a lot more. And a device, larger memory footprint, but here's the thing that always, you know, this is my favorite part, it's got its fingers in too many places, right? You don't want them um, overly centralized and you know, the comments in it all, right? You 
to grow. So, we're getting down towards the end. Um, so one of the things that, this was actually the hardest slide to write. Because I spend almost, okay, I probably spend 90 or 85% of my time for this. I occasionally interact with Linux, um, but you know, I don't spend a huge amount of time in the, in the source tree. Uh, I don't do extensions for Linux. I usually look at it because someone's like, you know, did you go look at this? I think this is broken. Or why doesn't FreeBSD do what Linux does? That's always a good one. Well, let me go see what Linux does. Um, so this is our hard slide to right? Um, and in particular, we both had things we learned from each other. Um, on our side, on the FreeBSD side, people need to realize that abstraction has a price. <clears throat> it has a price of performance. It has a price, mostly it's a price of performance. Um, Perfect can be the enemy of the good. Uh, we definitely have taken our time on some things that we probably should have done a little faster. And second place can also be the last place. Um, a broad platform catches more users. Right? The more people we appeal to, the more users we get, the more developers we get, the more people are going to work on our stuff. Right? Building a system that is narrowly focused, which I wouldn't say we built it that narrow, but um, one of the things the Linux camp does very well is reaches out to pretty much everyone who wants to mess with computers, which is still a pretty narrow group, but uh, it's, it's, we're not as broad. I mean, still, this is, by the way, the, one of the things that I think the Linux camp does extremely well. Um, the install experience is key. Uh, ESDs have spent too long being like, yeah, look, if you can't install it, we don't want to talk to you. Now, we don't actually say that on mailing lists very often, but it's certainly something that, you know, everybody's laughing because you're all developers, right? Um, but it's certainly an attitude that we have come to, right? It's like, well, you know, why would we care to help someone install it? If they can't install it, they probably can't use it effectively. It's like, well, you never know, they might learn. Um, but they're not going to learn if they can't get the damn thing installed. So, uh, in my opinion, on the Linux side, some of the things would make the Linux kind of a little better off. Um, stable KPIs. Everyone, and I'll put this on the tape, every company I've ever talked to that has moved from Linux to FreeBSD or compared the two, the first thing that they say, developers and management, is it is so nice to know that things will not move out from under me as an exclusive. And it's just super important. And I think, you know, I think it's just one of those things that's going to have to happen because you don't want to go from 2.x to 3.x or 3.x to 3.x plus one because it's just too risky. You know, sure, if it's your desktop, that's fine. But if you've rolled out, you know, millions of dollars in hardware, let's say, for instance, you put software in power plants. I know some power plants that are about to change their software. You really want to, you know, have to revalidate everything to go just with a minor upgrade? You don't, right? You're terrified of that. So, stable KPI is really important. Revisit your code, well, clearly that's an enterprise thing. And customers care about longevity. The problem with, I suspect most of the people in this room, including myself, is we're running the software for ourselves, and we're then, you know, putting it in products and giving it to other people. But people don't upgrade that often. Right? And people don't want to upgrade that often. And when they do upgrade, they want to be involved. So it's something that really has to be baked into the system. It's, it's really important. And I think it's one of the things that, that you guys are going to class. I think we do, we do a perfect job. Trust me, I've dealt with some of our imperfect jobs. Um, we do do a pretty good job. All right, questions. All right, two questions. Back there, All right. two questions. So how about the fashion? I can't so we have, we have a microphone, so please, uh, please raise your hand and put the microphone on you. So how about comparison between Solaris and the BSD stuff? Oh, uh, that's a whole other hour. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the question was uh, comparisons between Solaris and BSD systems. So in the beginning, um, Sonos was actually a BSD-based system. Bill Joy went and started Sun with a bunch of people, and the Sonos versions up through Solaris uh, 
were all BSD derived, BSD 43 and BSD 44. I am told, I don't know if I want to say this on tape, I am told that when AT&T wanted to work with Sun, Bill Joy claimed that he could get AT&T to adopt BSD and drop their own units. Huge. Uh, something. Some object on that person that's really large. Turns out that was not the case. So, um, I don't know by the end how much Solaris had in common with BSDs internally. I do know some developers who actually were key in developing Solaris, so I could actually ask them. Um, but the Solaris stuff is closer to BSD than Linux because the Solaris stuff was ATT Unix with various bits, you know. They, I think they eventually dropped streams in favor of the TCP IP stack, so it really depended on where you looked. Yes, get a microphone to that man. Well, there was someone in the back too, by the way. Um, when FreeBSD moved over to Clang, uh, was that more of a push from, let's say, downstream from like Yahoo or Apple, or was that uh, you guys you guys wanted to move over to Clang? So the question is when, so the FreeBSD project, for those who don't know, we have moved our core compiler from the GCC and GNU stuff to um, Clang and LLVM. There are many reasons for that. Some of them are political, some of them are technical. So RMS, we can go here tomorrow, tell you the wonders of GPL v3 and how it created this. None of our vendors in a, in a, any of, or any of our customers want to hear it. <clears throat> But there were many reasons. One was, you know, we can't ship GPL v3 code, right? We just can't do it. Uh, it's a policy on the project, and it's one of the things we do to protect our downstream. So we had an aging compiler, <coughs> which, you know, that's not a good thing. So and suddenly you're like, well, yes, you can compile it out of the box, but you really want the latest one from ports, et cetera. The other reason to switch to Clang and LLVM is because they rock, right? So go read some of the emails, in particular some recent emails from RMS on the internal architecture of GCC. GCC is meant so that no one else can ever understand it. That's just wrong, right? LLVM is written so that anyone can understand it. And in particular, anyone can use it. It's a really good modern compiler. Now, you know, the output, the output is good. You know, there's always the neck and neck like thing of competition, you know, who outputs better, who emits better assembly language, better, better machine code. But, you know, when you want to do things like Apple wanted to be able to do special instructions for graphics, and other people want to be able to, like, actually, I'm looking at LLVM as a way of uh, working on network packets, right? You want to be able to build all these new back ends in that can handle all kinds of stuff. You want to put in new front ends for new languages. <coughs> LLVM and Clang just make that a dream, right? And that's why we, we moved to it. It was not only a license issue, but it was a technology issue. And until, basically, until GCC had been GPLv3, there was not very serious competition. But then the combination of that with RMS's intransigence on how to extend it caused Chris Latner and his folks to be like, I need a modern compiler suite that I can modify. We're gonna write it. And then Apple came along and said, oh, we really like you. What if we give you a lot of money and some engineers? And they said, we like that. <laughs> and out of that comes a really new compiler, which they open source, right? It's BSD licensed, anyone can use it. Um, so there, there are a whole suite of reasons for it. Uh, there was a question at the back. Yes. Can you say more about your new book? Can you turn up the mic? I cannot hear what he says. He said, can you say some more about your new book? <laughs> about what? New, new book. book. New book. Oh, uh, I'm supposed to sell. So, well, it's happening is the, the thing that's making it hard to hear. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> what am I supposed to say with the new book? So, um, so I worked. So it's very, I actually find this kind of amusing, and I love to talk, torture Kirk, my co-author on this. He's been writing the book for a long time. I bought the book with my, the 4-3 book, I bought with my own money in college and read on my own. I always like to point that out to Kirk since I'm 13 years younger than he is. Um, I then reviewed the 4-4 book, and then I co-authored the latest, the 10 year ago FreeBSD book, and I'm one of two co-authors on, you know, with three of us working on the Kirk book. Um, we're going to cover a lot more ground. So. You know, there's a whole chapter on ZFS. Uh, everything is updated. I've added new protocols. I, I handle the networking chapters. Kirk doesn't like, well, I wouldn't say he doesn't like networking, but if he can avoid working on it, he will. So I'm like, oh, okay. Um, you know, I've uh, rewritten all the sections on networking. 
we had an SCTP, we've added the, uh, the new congestion control schemes. Um, the whole new chapter on security written by Robert Watson, who's at uh, the University of Cambridge, a pretty well-known security and FreeBSD guy. Um, did Capscom, if the sandboxing in your phones, he probably had something to do with that. Um, so there's a new security chapter, there's a new chapter in ZFS, whole new uh, set of work on the network chapter, D-Trace is covered, uh, all the VM stuff is new, and the book is a rewrite from the ground up using the same infrastructure. But I mean, we like to keep some words because it's hard to rewrite every single one of them, but there's a lot of, a lot of revision in the book. Uh, yes, and then there's one in the back. Uh, I have two questions. When was your migration from CBS to SBN? And are you kind of moving from SBN to something like it? Or your um, co-revision? Can't answer political questions during this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I was there for it. I don't remember the exact year. CBS to SBN, it's got to be <coughs> over six years ago now. I'm getting old and my memory's not getting good about how long ago things were. It used to be better, so maybe six, seven years ago. Uh, we switched to Subversion, and we looked at a lot of stuff. I actually, and I, I will say this up, up front, I'm a big fan of distributed, um, see, you know, uh, VCSs, so I like it. Um, I also like Mercurial, just because I'm a laptop person and I hate to be in an office, right, so it's, it's far easier. Um, I, currently there are no plans to move to Git. There is a Git bridge, for want of a better word. You can actually interact with Project Grid with Git. <clears throat> but if you're committing directly to the tree, you're supposed to commit to subversion. Uh, and there are some reasons that make it very difficult to use Git. Uh, one of the things is it's very hard to obliterate in Git. So, for instance, let's say maybe someone at some point commits something illegal to the tree. Now, I won't ever say that that's happened because you can't prove that it has. But let's say they have. <laughs> um, some source code control systems will not let you root that out. Right? You've, someone's committed basically source code that they don't own to the tree, and someone gives you a cease and desist letter, and you have to prove to a lawyer that code does not exist in anyone's repository anywhere on earth. Yeah, very, very, very difficult to get or material because, you know, I mean, yes, you could, you could keep a copy of the subversion, but your central repository has a number, and it's like we went from X to Y to Z. Y was obliterated. Right? We can prove to the lawyer why it was obliterated. That's one of the reasons we, we went to subversion. It was actually one of the big sticking points from CBS. Because CBS really allowed you to do that. You could be like, that revision, and that revision was gone. And that turns out to be pretty important in a project that lasts 20 years. Right? Because people are going to do things we really shouldn't do. Um, and the, so that's one of the things keeping us in subversion, I think. Um, the other is that. While people have been pretty successful using Git on their own, and Linux uses Git, and there's you know, a whole bunch of projects using Git, and I'm not talking, I'm not picking on just Git, Git or whatever. Pick your your uh, DVCF, D, yes, pick your DVCS. <clears throat> Distributed is always harder, and it's harder to understand, and people make more mistakes, and they shoot themselves in the foot. And if you've ever done the wrong rebase on your tree, you, you know, someone's giggling you know that, that there's going to be a problem. So, for the moment, we're sticking, sticking with some questions Okay, so in the beginning, you kind of glazed over Dragonfly BSD. I figure it's kind of the bastard child of the BSDs. I can explain if you want. Um, yeah, because like I know it does a couple of things that BSDs don't do, like the Amiga-like system calls, use another file system altogether. Is there, like, like in a very quick way, what is it about Dragonfly that's totally different from the other BSDs? So Dragonfly comes, Dragonfly comes out of um, the wishes of a single developer on the FreeBSD project to do SMP in a different way. And he's a very clever guy, um, but let's just say he was not able to work well with others. Uh, and so he went off and did his own work. And he has done some really interesting work, but uh, thus far it has not really been production quality in the same way that uh, BSDs are. And the Hammer stuff is interesting research. Um, the slice stuff, interesting research. He's done some clever stuff. But how many people are really storing data in him? Like, really storing, like, you know, seriously. I'll get back to you on that. Okay, fair enough. Um, 
So I consider the Dragonfly stuff to be more advanced research. And also, the way he's dealt with SMP <clears throat> has not led to good scalability for Dragonfly. Other questions? Yeah, where? You've got the mic. Just answer the question. So how big is the project? How many you know, people have this? Oh, okay, so the project. So um, there are about 300 source committers. Those are people who can commit to the tree. There are uh, many more ports committers. I don't know how many there are. Um, I know that the, the, the source bits is about 300. Um, so I'd probably say maybe 1,000 people have port access. Uh, and then, but, and then there's documentation, so it's, it's over a thousand people working on it. Move on. Hi, uh, your disks in the back, the previous weekend, I was looking for a lot of my things, it's three to six. I was wondering if that will really run on my disks. So, I know that Ubuntu's version of three to six does not. Okay, so the question was that there's some i386 uh, DVDs in the back. Will they run on a real i386? Um, we have not yet removed all of the, like, I mean, it'll run on well, any of them. Um, I don't know, let's see, will it run on a Silpris? There's a lot that's changed since the three years. Yeah, I'm trying to remember how far back we can get it. will not. It will not run on a 386 proper, but supposedly you can get it run in a 486 or newer. Okay, so 486 or newer. 386 is the architecture of the PA. No, it's not. Uh, well, there is a PAE version. There is still a PAE version. Yeah, there's a PAE version. You can get one of them. I don't know that those discs were Next question. Um, just recently, the development schemes and the fast networking. I've noticed a lot of um, projects coming out where they sort of grab the PCI device, network device for all. Um, one I've been following now is this snap switch. What do you have any thoughts about that? Snap switch? I don't know. Are you think it's something like that? Yeah. So, so it essentially does the um, it grabs the PCI device for all and then it uses space, um, does the whole network driver again. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it's a little bit much faster than you thought they'd be Yep. So, uh, we have that, that actually runs, that actually runs on, we have something called NetMap that went to Rizzo, who's at the uh, University of Pisa. Yeah, he's in Pisa. Um, there's some really amazing cover stuff. He's the one who did uh, IPFW and WNet, um, which are Firewall, and WNet is a way of doing some nice network stuff. Um, <clears throat> we built up this thing called NetMap that when we built on 3DSDN, it's portable. And that exposes the NICD user space, and that works with the Intel NICs and the Chelsea NICs. I don't think it works with solar flare, um, but you know, more support for that is going in. And then he's done a, also an internal switch called the ALE. I think he knows about it, because he's done it, I'm not sure. Um, and that gives you basically a high speed switch for virtualization. So, yeah, that, we, we have that kind of thing. Right. Well, um, next question was do you have any? I do not. I don't know the NBA standards and stuff as well, so I, mean, I, I know that too. That's a pretty good question. The whole recent thing of Debian and its system, the system D versus SPN, um, is there any plan for FreeBSD to refine their NBA system or borrow any sort of secret type features from the NBA There, There is some discussion of that. Um, there, so the question is a much different thing. So uh, we are discussing you know, upgrading the NBA system. Uh, we have not made any decisions, but of course the system D stuff is all too easy for it, so we have to take ideas. Other questions? Could we please talk about the existing practices that the production of new features versus patching on the testing? I'm sorry, can you repeat that more loudly? Uh, could you please talk about the testing practices of PSD, like when you introduce a new feature or you go patch oh. on your test it? Um, we test, we test in production. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so we have uh, various testing regimes depending on who's doing it. So one of the things that I've done for the project <clears throat> in my role on core and on the foundation 
is I uh, helped to acquire and build a network test model. So a lot of the things, when we expect developers, you know, source developers, to test their code before they can um, But obviously there are things that not every developer has access to. For instance, 10 gig switch. So when 10 gig was on the horizon and it was looking like people were gonna go that direction, I was able to get a whole bunch of hardware donated. We have a, a lab that's hosted by this group, uh, this company, Syntex, up in Canada, giving very kind of us. Uh, we've got a couple of racks up there of, of high-end switching gear and high-end tech gear. Um, but because we work so closely with, event, with our vendors, we often find out you know, about issues or things from them directly. So you know, we work with Intel. So when there's a problem on an Intel chip, they tell us. Because they're running, like their vehicles are running. People who are building products will find them. So there's various uh, stuff. Also, uh, one of the people who's developed a lot of the new testing infrastructures in the room, I sort of generally point at it. Um, so we're currently moving to a set of uh, in system regression tests. We've had various tests in the past, but they've been very specific to like, I can test this, I can test this. And uh, the new QA system, which is what it's called. Um, is a framework for doing that. That's that's going to really help us out. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna say okay. we're getting. Yeah, we're getting close to the time for questions. One more question, you say? Two more. Okay, two more questions. You have someone over there. All right. So. Can you talked briefly. You talked briefly on SMP and FreeBSD. I'm curious. Would you compare and contrast that with Linux? Is that we? I know Linux has all CPU. What does FreeBSD have in that area? So, um, in terms of you know the di different types of locking, uh, you know, there's we have mutexes and we have you know we have, we both have similar things. One of the things that Linux has <clears throat> better than FreeBSD is patent protection. Ever heard of the RCU patent? Well, there's only one operating system that's allowed to use it, and it's Linux. So, locking systems in Linux. Currently use RCU. It turns out RCU just you know, is timed out. So hopefully we'll all have RCU. Um, we do have locks that are similar, but you'll find that the uh, the lock-free stuff that you'll find in Linux you will not in terms of locking down um, But for all intents and purposes, you know the types of locks you get in an operating system are pretty much you know Dijkstra wrote them down, and we just <laughs> right. So they're they're pretty similar. Between in terms of the sort of kernel API, what you get. There was one more question. Okay, yeah. This is the last. So okay. Can you talk about the workloads in the system about browsers, which has not about this one? How about uh, the mic right up to your mouth? Yeah, can you talk about the workloads apart from the router switches? How about the SAP, Oracle, Excel, these kind of heavy workloads, so how much force it can scale up? So, um, well, that's what we're talking about. I mean, Look at a NetApp filer, and that thing's you know going full 10 gig all the time, you know slamming the disks using SSDs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, we can trivially uh, saturate 10 gig links, uh, 40 gig links, 100 gig links using off-the-shelf hardware, right? uh, especially in the networking space, we particularly well. So, and then people are adding, like you look at the features like NetMap, <clears throat> and we can do mega generation. So at full speed, or uh, Intel has just announced support for DPDK on FreeBSD. So I'm actually doing a port to import their thing into the port system, so we can have packet tech. So you know, that allows to do tech um, No one builds a switch around a commercial operating system. The commercial operating system might be in the control plane, like in an ARISTA switch or you know, blade switch, but the switching is actually done hard. So you know, we can. We can move a lot of bits, but we're never going to be an ASIC. <laughs> All right, so that, that's it for the questions. Why don't we go to the, we have um, the uh, quiz. We have six books up here. This time it's all physical books. So um, we're just going to have questions, and you guys are going to have answers. And whoever raises their hand and is called on first will get a shot at answering it and picking up and picking up more books. And none of these are free BSD books. But <laughs> 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 all right, that's it. They're all up. But, um, <laughs> All right, so um, shoot, uh, basically, sorry, this is an unfair thing. I mean, it's gonna be more I can see, so I'm gonna try to move around and give everyone a chance at the question. Please don't shout out an answer, because you're just not gonna get to that one. Um, don't be upset, it's just, okay, cool. 
Okay, so uh, question number one, who wrote the fast file system for, for uh, BSD? I see your hands. Yeah, Marshall Pilkut. He's got it. Yep, oh no, it's because I worked at a book. He's really good at this. Uh, okay, so uh, what's the name I write under? I saw a YouTube series. Oh, 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 oh. I'm going to go over here. Oh, okay, go for it. He's like. You got the right answer. Okay, come on up. Sorry about that. Code vicious. Yeah, pick the first slide. Second slide. Alright. Uh, okay, uh, in FreeBSD, why don't we want to change the size of the structure? Uh, you in the back in the middle. That's correct. One up. Um, where is, uh, nah, that's not uh, Okay, so, um, name one downside of a ski buff. One downside of an MBUF. I saw your hand first. Abstract network structure in uh, FreeBSD. Um, you and that, the back seems to be dominated here. You're jumping the block. Uh, what? Nope. Okay. Uh, what's the name of the abstract network structure in FreeBSD? Let's do one more. One person passes.